I want to do a little bit of a deeper dive of how we see the persistent memory tier itself, um, because it's not just a static caching tier like we often think about it. Um, we're actually finding that the persistent memory tier is, is being adopted in, in two primary models uh, with some of our customers. And I'm going to talk to you today about how that's being done. You know, the real premise of this is that the, the innovation that's coming around the software and taking advantage of the ratios that, that uh, Frank mentioned and the, the features is, is really spawning whole new products and, and industries and ideas. And it, it's really exciting. So the first use case within that tier that, that we often see is what we call persistent memory acting as memory uh, for memory use cases. So in that use case, we have a thin DRAM performance tier, and then the persistent memory acts as a capacity tier. But I think the surprise win that we're seeing a lot more of than we thought that, that we would is that we're seeing a lot of innovation emerge in the ecosystem and with our software developers around what we're calling two-tier storage use cases. And in these use cases, persistent memory is used as a performance tier to the NAND capacity tier. And um, there's a combination of software and hardware innovation required to make that happen. But that's where a lot of our customers are really starting to see real value. I want to highlight three of them that in the last year have, have really stood out for me um, for, for where we're seeing game changing either performance or, or um, happenings. So Oracle recently announced that their X8M appliance and their cloud services had standardized on Optane persistent memory. So 100% of their um, appliances ship with it. It's, it's built into their cloud service infrastructure. Um, but under the hood, what you might not have realized is that they had optimized their Exadata system to use the persistent memory as a new data tier. Uh, it wasn't really storage. It wasn't really memory. It did a little bit of both. Um, and it helped to accelerate their database commits. They rewrote the software to use replication over RDMA. And this is really key because it frees up the storage server CPU from having to handle a lot of those IOs. Um, and by doing this, they were able to achieve two and a half X better performance uh, with 10 X lower latency than their standard X8. Um, we're hearing anecdotally from them that they don't even sell the X8 anymore. People are choosing just to go with the X8M um, and they were able to, because they're able to do it so affordably. So they're a fantastic example of a platform that was just built around the persistent memory uh, technology and one that couldn't have been built without it. Um, another great example, I know we talked with some of you about six months ago, uh, we did one of these events and we talked to you about Deos. Um, that's Distributed Asynchronous Object Store. And it's really the foundation of Intel's Exascale storage stack. Uh, we shared some exciting results um, and we have more to share today on that. But for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's an open source scale out object store. It provides high bandwidth and low latency storage functionality, but it's built fundamentally around Optane persistent memory. It, it, it can't do it with any other technology. Um, Dales uses PMEM as that hot data tier that I was talking about, storing the small IOs and metadata. And then the larger, more block-friendly IOs are stored in your traditional storage or SSDs. Um, this solution is really kicking butt, if I can be frank. It's delivering 5 to 15x uh, higher performance than traditional distributed parallel file systems. And uh, we shared with you last time we were together that uh, the top three world records for supercomputers in the 10 node cluster challenge were set with Deos using um, Optane persistent memory. So uh, Kelsey's going to talk to you next. She's going to share a sneak peek at some progress we've made since we last talked. Um, so I won't spoil that. I'll move on to my last example. Um, and, and that's a new category called big memory. And if you're following along, IDC has actually just adopted that new category in their market research. Um, and it, it's called out separate from, from memory. And within this category, there's a new small startup that we've been working with closely called Memverge. Um, they are a, a great, great company. And um, they're an example of a, of a small company that has started innovating around the technology to create an entirely new type of product. So their software provides virtualized pools of memory with storage capability to just about any application. Um, so with the lightning fast application recovery uh, using in-memory snapshots um, to the seamless access to persistence 
without code optimization. Um, this solution is actually, we're seeing strong success in the financial services market and in HPC. Um, they're also working with uh, AI and machine learning applications as well. Um, so I, I highlight that because um, I think as we talked about last time, uh, just selling hardware doesn't get you very far down, down the road of, of providing real value. But when we start to see the ecosystem and software developing around the hardware, that's where the real value gets created. So each of these solutions, um, if you attend the event and watch the sessions, you'll get to learn more about how this was done. So I don't, I don't need to belabor it, but suffice it to say that we're seeing a lot of innovation in the ecosystem around persistent memory. And I have one more software innovation that I wanna share with you. Um, and, and then we can move on to Kelsey, which I know that's the exciting part. Um, so we've been talking about software innovation and how important it is, um, but we announced yesterday a new feature called EADR, or Enhanced Asynchronous DRAM Refresh. Um, and we talked a little bit about it. It's actually a feature that we've been building into the open standard or open uh, programming model for persistent memory. And in case you're not aware, that programming model is not unique to Optine. It's applicable to any NVDIM technology. Um, so there's a lot of features under the hood that, that people aren't aware of. And, and so yesterday we rolled out the enhanced uh, asynchronous DRAM. I'll tell you what it is, but basically um, memory in cache is not always persistent. We've known this and we've lived with it for 50 years. Um, but some persistent memory aware applications actually have to issue cache flushes periodically to move that cache data into the persistent memory to make sure that the stores are persistent. Um, when these, these flushes, they can impact performance because the application often has to wait to make sure it's complete before it can move on. Um, this new feature that we announced yesterday uh, will be available on Ice Lake OEM platforms. It does require that the OEM provide some uh, power capability um, so that there's time to do the flush. Uh, but basically those applications, once they sense that EADR is available, they can avoid the weights entirely. They detect EADR, they skip the cache flushes, and they know that the system will do the flushes automatically, even if it experiences a power failure. Um, so it's something that our OEM partners and, and Oracle and, and some of these uh, providers are now designing in um, to their platforms. So EADR uses that additional stored energy from the platform and it allows the automatic cache flushes to complete before the system shuts down. Um, good news is any application following the SNEA persistent memory programming model already checks for EADR and there's nothing that has to be done to benefit from it. Um, and then the persistent memory development kit uh, is available now for developers. I'm gonna hand it over now to Kelsey Prantis um, and she's going to share with you a sneak preview of some of our early um, Series 200 uh, DAOS results. So uh, I'm happy to come back again. As uh, Christy mentioned, we were able to uh, come to one of these Tech Field Day events a few months back, and we talked a bit uh, about DAOS and our IO500 records at that time. So I'm really happy to get to come back again and talk a bit more about Deos and uh, what we're seeing with the next generation of persistent memory. Uh, of course, you know, I want this to be interactive, so please be sure to uh, interrupt me as we go. Uh, but as a refresher, you know, as was mentioned, Deos is a distributed parallel file system. Uh, this is something that we started at Intel actually back in about 2012. Uh, so about eight years ago, we were looking at storage today and we were taking a look at what some of the common bottlenecks were that were really preventing us from uh, being able to reach new levels of performance. Uh, and there have been a long-standing bottleneck that's plagued storage for a long time. And if you look at all sorts of historical storage media, whether you're talking HDDs, whether you're talking 3D NAND SSDs, it doesn't matter. They all have sort of a fundamental way that the media is storing your data on disk in that it's storing it in these large sized blocks. But your data in your application, right, your data in your application is not stored in these large size blocks and you end up having a sort of translation that happens from the data in your application, serializing it down to the blocks and onto disk. And what happens when you do that flattening that you can start to see here, and uh, Frank touched on this as well, 
But if you look at this example here, you start to have different pieces of data, especially small data and metadata that end up needing to share a block. So in this example here, you have uh, block five, for example, in the bottom middle here, uh, you have two different pieces of data sharing a block that may not have anything to do with each other. Uh, and what happens then is when you have different clients then who are trying to access and modify these blocks uh, from different clients in your distributed cluster, you actually have to take a lock on this whole block. So those different unrelated activities now have to be serialized instead of being able to operate in parallel. We do that several million times across our big supercomputers clusters, and you really start to see a huge bottleneck uh, in your performance appear. But there was just nothing really uh, to be able to do about that in the past. You can't use DRAM when you have storage. You kind of need it to be persistent when you reboot your node. So there was never really an option. But when persistent memory came along, it really gave us an entirely new type of storage device that we could use to store our data. So in Deus, we do treat persistent memory as a first-class storage device and take advantage of its persistence. But because it has low latency byte granular access instead of these large blocks, it actually really freed us from this particular bottleneck. So the way we took advantage of that in Deos and created an architecture for Deos is we actually go ahead, we still take advantage of um, NVMe SSDs, right? I think for your bulk and large IOs, right? There's still a big TCO argument for why you would include these in your solution. But then we also have incorporated the Intel Optane PMEM as well. And this is where we store all of our small IOs as well as all of our meta data. And by small IOs, I mean something around, you know, IOs that are uh, 4K and under. So quite small. So we store all of those inside your PMM. Then when you still have your larger, more block-friendly IOs, those go into your uh, NVMe SSDs. So as we shared last time we were here, right, we submitted this to the IO500 list at ISC this last summer. Uh, we were very pleased with our results and the full list we did get um, first place. We also, in the 10 node challenge where everyone's limited to 10 clients, took the top three. So this was using only 30 nodes of um, Optane PMEM. And we were able to, you know, beat at the time the best supercomputers uh, that were existing. But what we think is exciting now, right? So we're already setting these sorts of records, but now we're taking a look forward to the next generation of PMEM in the Intel Optane Persistent Memory 200 series and starting to take a look at what new uh, performance that brings to Deos. So what we found, we did some uh, comparisons in our lab, right? So we have um, dual socket systems, right? Each of these dual socket systems have uh, dual OPA connections at 100 gigs uh, and are fully uh, complete with Intel persistent memory. And what we actually found, even though there's, there's about 33% more channels, so you get more bandwidth because there's more channels, but we actually found when we did our initial testing without making any changes to Deos or any sort of modifications, just using the same software on the new generation of hardware, we actually saw a 58% improvement in our write bandwidth, which we think is just really uh, astounding that, you know, the media is already giving us that much of a jump in the next generation. So we're really excited to then take this to, you know, the next IO500 and be able to run on this new generation and see what uh, those new scores we're going to generate. You started developing the, this uh, solution in 2012 when yes. Obtain was not available and NVMe was not even a protocol yet, not, not defined. So, and, and, you know, of course, you have, you know, there was a vision there or something, but I was Deus at the very beginning. I mean, uh, uh, you, you had to modify the product in, in this uh, in this journey, I mean, to, to get advantage of, of this. So at the very beginning, it was not the same deals that we have today, right? So, I mean, you, you have to take into account the technology that you had at that time, and then you evolved the, the deals. So one of the benefits we had of being inside Intel is we had foresight into what of these technologies were coming down the pipeline. So while we didn't have the physical media to use, what we actually did while we were developing is we were creating temp FSs on DRAM 
a substitute for the PMEM while we were working on development so that we could plan our development to be able to intersect, to be ready, you know, on a similar timeline as the actual silicon would be ready. So we did actually really, the code base we have now, right, we designed from the ground up to be able to use with persistent memory, but we had to do uh, in the early days before it existed, right, we had to do some development uh, against DRAM, but obviously then that wasn't persistent, right? That, that was the answer I was expecting. And actually, this leads me to the next question. So uh, do you have a production version of those and a development, you know, R&D kind of version of those? Because, you know, at some point you have to stop somewhere and say, okay, this is something that you can use in production and this is our you know, bleeding edge kind of stuff that we are working on to, to showcase the technology. I mean. Yes, absolutely. So we had the Deus 1.0 release back in June. That was really designed and targeted towards our uh, OEM partners and integrators. And then we have our next community release scheduled uh, just this upcoming quarter in a couple months uh, in Q1 21. And that is set to be uh, the first version that we are saying is uh, production ready and ready for people to use for that level of um, you know, data consistency and that sort of stability you want to have from your file system. So that's about to come out today uh, in, in, you know, the next couple of months. Related questions. Uh, great hero numbers. Outstanding. Uh, help us understand, and this is a lot of the pushback when I hear about PMEM and Intel, not necessarily Intel Optane, but PMEM in general. <laughs> We get a lot of the marketing hero numbers from Dales, et cetera. But when I'm talking about just stuff that I do in my typical enterprise data center, it's usually not this stuff. It's, you know what, I'm running SQL. I love the exadata stuff. I'll run some exadata. How is that translating to my purchasing decisions when I'm deciding, one, if I should frankly hold off or from Cascade Lake to Ice Lake? And then two, if I should look at another x86 provider who's not bringing this capability to bear, like what, what are some of the practicals I should take away from this? Yeah, let me let me take a stab at the, just the, per, the first question, which is, is really, hey, these are great numbers, but HPC and supercomputers is not every person's IT organization. Um, and then uh, I'll also touch on the Deos and then let, let Kelsey answer that. So. Um, I, I do think that that's really consistent and fair feedback. You know, keep in mind that we are establishing a new technology tier that is very powerful, but that can be used in many different ways. So it's it's got a little bit of the features of memory, a little bit of the storage, and depending on your workload or use case, you know, your your performance numbers may be very different. And in fact, it might even be slower than DRAM um, if you're if you're you know for you mentioned SQL and some of these legacy databases that are more standard in the enterprise. Um, so I think it's, in, it's important to really grok and understand that you have to, it's a very uh, use case specific um, type of, of um, answer that you get for performance. In the enterprise where we're seeing persistent memory, you know, most commonly adopted is the general purpose virtualized infrastructure um, with VMware. VMware is a very common hypervisor um, solution and, and really, customers are using it not for performance, but for cost reduction. And we're seeing on average a 30%, you know, total solution cost reduction when they can balance the core to memory ratios. Um, VDI is another example. Um, Microsoft SQL is, is a perfect example of one where we don't actually recommend that if it's bare metal SQL, you're not going to see a, a strong perf per TCO because that's been architected forever not to need a lot of memory. Um, now, if it's virtualized, you know, you start to be able to um, share those resources and, and provide that TCO. Um, so I guess it's a long winded way of saying that your mileage will vary um, and that that virtualized infrastructure is the primary target and the other is in memory databases. We're seeing lots of growth there. Now, Deos is unique um, in that it was created for and with a, a customer. Uh, I think Kelsey can talk a little bit about the history. Um, and it is a very specific uh, storage re-architecture use case. It's, a, it's an amazingly efficient file system uh, technology. Uh, it is not 
intended by Intel, we uh, up until recently weren't we weren't trying to take it and sell it. It's completely open source. We do have cloud service providers as well as um, enterprises that are looking at doing custom implementations of Deos. Um, they're at they've actually been announced today, but they they had to do the heavy lifting and and the enterprise support. So we're getting close. Um, it is something where we're th thinking, wow, they've, we've come up with something that's really advantageous, um, but it's not quite ready for prime time, just going and selling it as a product. And so I think I would add to that, I guess there's a couple different layers of how do I access it, I view, right? One is who do I go buy it from, right? Like you were saying, if you talk about Weka or something like that, you know who to go buy it from. So that I think is where uh, Chris, you were just talking about, right? We're still, um, in that journey a bit and in the early stages of that. So we actually um, have had, you know, a number of partners and integrators make statements that about their intent to have Deos offerings. Like I believe the uh, RSC groups, a small integrator in Russia, for example, who's indicated that they're gonna be selling this, but also recently at the uh, Deos user group that we just had near supercomputing, both HPE and Lenovo also shared their plans for creating a Deos platforms and offerings for them. So while maybe today you can't do that, you know, I think if you start looking maybe six or nine months down the line, those integrators are going to be there. And since a lot of these systems do have some lead time, we think it's important to be talking about that now so that when these things are available, people will be uh, ready to understand how to consume them. Uh, the other end of it is, I think, how you access your data on it, right? So you think uh, most of the file systems that have been very popular uh, in the past have used very specific sets of interfaces, and maybe interfaces where we didn't even really think of them as interfaces, right? If you look at something like a Lustre or a GPFS or NFS, right, those all use what we call the POSIX interface. Uh, and then you also have um, some object stores that have gotten popular. Of course, S3 is a super popular interface and things like that. But we knew when we made Deos, right, that you can't expect all your applications are going to use a new interface. So we have spent actually a lot of time in being able to enable easy consumption of it as a file system still by working on a number of different um, middleware and framework layers that actually go between Deus and the application to make it easy for the applications to uh, consume Deus. So we have our own POSIX layer, so you can still, you know, all your legacy applications that do POSIX, you can still do POSIX IO directly into Deus. But we also saw there's an opportunity to easily enable a number of applications uh, without having to have them go through POSIX, because POSIX itself adds some performance constraints just by the nature of that interface. Uh, but we realized with a lot of applications weren't really managing their IO already. They were using these different sorts of uh, third-party frameworks or formats so that if we ported those frameworks and formats to be able to be done on Deos without having to rewrite your application, you could actually uh, have sort of the full performance benefit of Deos without having any inhibitor of POSIX. So for example, today we have things like Apache Spark support on top of Deos, uh, HDF5, MPIO. Uh, some of our partners are working on SegWi support for the oil and gas industry, for example. This actually goes into even further, um, perhaps innovative sorts of interfaces you wouldn't normally think of going on your file system. So for example, what we've been working on currently with Deos is actually Deos having its own distributed transactions internally, which actually could allow you to do something like create a SQL interface directly on top of Deos and be able to use Deos as your uh, backend for your database on a storage level uh, and be able to get you know, significantly more performance out of your hardware for your database in that scenario. I have a quick question um, sort of strategically about Deos. So this could be seen as almost competitive with some of the uh, partner companies and partner products in the storage industry. I mean, certainly it's a compelling storage platform. Is the idea that this is a demonstration for Intel technology or is this a code base that companies are, can build on or is this uh, filling an unserved niche in the storage industry? I mean, what is the goal of Deos? So I think that it's more than just an example. I mean, it is definitely an example and we want to, you know, point out that there's a lot of other technologies that could look to this as an example for how they could incorporate PMEM to increase the performance. But we also intend it for it to be a code base that people can go out and use, that our partners and OEMs will 
take into their software stacks and create these completed appliances that can come to end users because you know, we know that it takes a long time to mature a file system technology, right? Like I said, we started this in 2012. We sort of used this rule of thumb. We think it takes about 10 years for a file system to go from inception to really um, being in a strongly stable uh, sort of space. Uh, so we want people to be able to use it too, because if we waited till PMM came out and then looked to the industry to be able to say, hey, now go build your technologies on this, uh, it could take a long time, right, for that to sort of happen. But instead, we have uh, this code that has actually has a really permissive license, right? It's a, a BSD plus patent clause. So customers can actually really take it and transform it into whatever they need it to be to be able to make their own products out of it. Yes, Stephen, I think that's a really good question because um, if you think about the journey we're on, um, we are establishing a completely new um, uh, paradigm in the way that we think by introducing this new persistent memory tier. Um, it's really hard to just go out and tell customers, okay, go now buy it. We have to show them what can be done. We have to enable the industry. And, and that's why you see us focusing on some of the, even these small startups like Memverge that I was mentioning, or the fact that Oracle Exadata is building it in. It takes years. For, for these things to mature and develop. And um, Dale said, I think when we started, it was not intended to be you know, a file system offering that we were going to make uh, broadly available. And, uh, but I think that over time it has, we've just gotten tremendous traction. The innovation has been phenomenal and we're getting a lot of pull to, to either make it a product or you know, fully open source and support it. And we do, I mean, you talked about it being hero numbers and things as well, but I do want to put out part of the intent of the IO500 list to begin with is to try to uh, take each technology and put it actually against a range of different workloads, including some very challenging workloads. So really, if you look at overall IO500 scores and things like that, they're not meant to just be one big hero number and this is just the place where you do best, right? It's supposed to be a complete picture over a variety of workloads of how the fi different file systems are performing so that people can kind of try to have some understanding of the difference. Uh, it, it is, uh, I don't think I also fully under, uh, answered a previous question we talked about, well, so when do I use it? I, maybe I don't need to, you know, I don't need to be building the next exascale system, right? And we didn't intend this to be only for exascale systems. It's a partner we're working with uh, to do it, but that's not its only intent, right? Any, any case where, where your constraint is, is that you need to have more performance per dollar. This is the market where this plays, right? If you're looking for uh, just doing a big data store and capacity is the only thing you're looking at, right? Something like Deos is probably um, not gonna be your cup of tea, uh, but anytime you're looking towards, I really need more IOPS, more bandwidth so that I can make more efficient use of my resources and get to my uh, conclusion sooner the better. I mean, a lot of people, especially when you're doing things like uh, AI and data analytics, right? These the speed to results for many enterprise companies is going to impact um, a lot of their ability to be competitive in their individual industries because they the sooner they can get to these sort of AI conclusions and things like that, uh, the sooner they can start adjusting their business. And if they can do that ahead of their competitors, that's you know a real monetary difference to these different enterprise companies. Well, I, I, in, in my world, one of the practical advantages to solutions like this uh, is the ability to, to have this super dense, high IOP and throughput into things like data transfer for, you know, across internet to at 10 gigabit speeds and advantage. So I have, you know, these data cannons, what we called in, in the back of my last job at, at working at a pharma, this ability, I have all of this bandwidth to my collaborators, but I don't have the, the the data center capabilities to transfer at these super high rates. So we actually looked towards Optane as a solution. PMM wasn't out at the time, but uh, a, a solution like Dale's, and this is where I'm interested in it, not necessarily for the scale out capability, but for the density in a single system. If I can get six terabytes of, of, of up to six terabytes of, PMEM in a single system and then use that with uh, solutions like Dales to give me some type of file system or object store, then I'm chart I'm I'm solving practical problems. Right. You could you can use Dales.
AOC, but just on a single note, there's no sort of minimum scale to this. And then Deos under the hood will transparently handle all of the tiering between the PMEM and some NVMe SSDs for you. So you can do that. Obviously, if you want things like um, data protection and data redundancy, right, you're going to need to have more than one node. But, um, you know, it definitely works in that use case. And we get, you know, excellent performance even just looking on a single node. You know, we've been doing recent uh, internal experiments, for example, on like 4K reads, and we've gotten up to, um, we've gotten up to over, you know, a million read IOPS with 4K reads on a single server currently. I, I have a question on, on the tiering on that. Um, is there a limit? Because you said that can automatically tier between basically the PMIM and Optane. Is there a limit to the number of tiers that you've got architected into the DAO system? Uh, so can it go down to like spinning rust on, you know, within a specific node or something like that? Yeah. So yes and no. I'm going to answer that in two ways. So uh, this is what we have currently. We actually are currently doing some work adding the ability to have an additional tier in between these two, where you could actually have a, a put a couple Optane SSDs into your system in between the two, which then allows you to increase the density of your individual servers greater. So there's definitely a potential for expansion and not necessarily being fixed to those two. That being said, we do not currently have any plans to really extend this to also being on spinning HDDs. Uh, we think that there are a lot of amazing parallel file system solutions that already exist if your main goal is to write to HDDs and that that would probably be, um, you know, it would add a lot to um, potentially add latency to other situations where you're not using HDDs to be able to handle all the buffering and caching necessary to really work with HDDs. The way we envision that working in, if for folks who need more capacity is that they have two data tiers, right? That they have Deos as a performance tier uh, in one set of capacity, and then they might have something else like a luster as their capacity tier that's driving the storage onto the HDDs. And what we've done is we've created a data mover to be able to move your data back and forth between uh, Deos and Luster to start, but we'll be extending that to other backends as well. That allows you to have that tiered solution uh, inside your data center to still have the capacity on spinning disk, but then have this Deos performance tier. Now, Deos wouldn't be a burst buffer in that situation, right? This is a proper persistent performance tier, but we expect that from a TCO perspective, that that's how people will balance the sort of capacity versus performance needs.